I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. It was a historic moment. But over the next several years, news stories around the world would show two very different realities of what it meant to be a black man in America. Two rival gangs opening fire right in the middle of this busy car wash. Two people were killed. I'm Thelma Strait, and I'm a teacher, author, and mother of three. Nearly 15 years ago, I took 12 at-risk black adolescent boys on the road, hoping to keep them from the streets. They interviewed nearly 40 older black men from all walks of life and asked the kinds of questions that most kids spend a lifetime learning from their fathers. Today, they're young men, and they're coming of age in a country that increasingly resembles the one those older men fought to change. So I wanted to know, what would happen if I reunited the two generations again? Could it help keep these young men from becoming another statistic? Change has come to America. That day when Obama won, boy, you would have thought he killed somebody. Yes, we can. Raymond was in the ninth grade when Obama was elected. I had a teacher, like, he straight out just said, like, seeing Obama won was like watching the Twin Towers fall. What kind of comparison is that? The others had similar experiences. You'd hear all the kids saying that they're going to change, like move countries and all that. A lot of the white kids in there were going crazy, drawing monkeys on the, you know, in their binders and on the whiteboards and stuff. Just an eye opener that like, you know, no matter how well you know somebody, it just takes one moment mm. to see stuff come out of them that you would have never expected. Since then, these young men have watched the country grow more openly intolerant, and they're worried about how much worse it'll get. Because honestly, passive is getting us nowhere. It's going to have to come down to something big, dangerous, and it's going to be a very wild time when that happens. That's why I decided to bring back a man who'd been on the front lines during a very dangerous era for Black people. Nice to meet you again, Mr. Right. Yates, after so Same many years. Here. Alton Yates had his eyes opened in the 1950s at Holloman Air Force Base. But it wasn't because of the racism there. It was because of the lack of it. Out there in the real world, you still had all of those horrors. But for the four and a half years I was assigned to Holloman, there had been absolutely no discrimination. Yates took part in a special project testing the effect of space travel on the human body. Stopping at one and two tenths seconds, it was like you ran straight into a stone wall head on at hundreds of miles an hour. You're aware of all kinds of pain everywhere, and sometimes those effects would last a week, sometimes three weeks, up to a month. But the experience that shaped his future happened on his way back home, after he left the service. I had been cited by the Department of Defense for having risked my life more than 65 times for science. There wasn't very much that could frighten me until I crossed over into Mississippi. I became frightened. I walked into the restaurant and this big white guy grabbed me on the shoulder, used the N-word, and told me that they didn't serve my kind in there. There was a huge billboard on the side of the road that said Knights of the Ku Klux Klan across the top. And it had a picture of a black person hanging from a tree. And it used the N-word. And it said, don't let the sun set on you in this county. Oh, wow. I promised myself that I was going to do something to try to change those conditions. It's amazing. In the summer of 1960, Yates helped stage a sit-in at a lunch counter and temporarily shut it down. But when they returned the following week, the Ku Klux Klan was waiting. There was a truck parked 
near where that great car is down there. And there were guys standing on the back passing out ax handles to a large group of men. Some had the Confederate battle flag. Somebody saw us marching across Laura Street. It was like the wind blew them all in that direction. About eight of us doubled back and we went into the Woolworth store. Just as we got seated, then a group of folk rushed in and started beating us with ax handles. I was hit on the back of the head. Somehow we were able to get out through a side door. My ears were ringing and a serious headache. That whole area around the park, all of that area was just full of people. And you could hear the screaming and it was a nightmare. I was frightened beyond anything anybody could imagine. I mean, people being beaten simply because of the color of their skin. Another survivor of that brutal assault was Nat Glover, who later became sheriff. He was just a teen headed home from a part-time job when that white mob attacked. And they quickly surrounded me with those ax handles and started hitting me. I've never been that afraid in all my life because I thought they might kill me. And I was embarrassed because I ran. So that day, I pledged to myself that I would never run away from a fight. Never. I would rather die than run. We learned a lesson, all right. And that lesson was that you don't stop simply because you're threatened with, with violence. Apparently, it wasn't until a group of black teenagers arrived to fight back that police finally appeared. I think it was Life magazine that had the picture of an innocent bystander who was on his way to work but he was beaten bloody. And did the mayor, did he react to this? Yeah, he did. His reaction was, that didn't happen. Wow. And not a single member of either group came in contact with an individual of the opposite group. About seven months later, lunch counters were finally integrated. Do you feel like something like that could happen again? You're going to always have those who feel like whatever you gain, they lose something. But here's the encouraging thing that I would say to you. If you paid attention to the George Floyd crisis, there were times that I saw more white people demonstrating than blacks. What advice would you give us on how to navigate racism? But don't run away. Yeah. Yeah. Stay and fight the good fight. It's worth it. So I wondered, had any of these conversations made a difference? And what about the kids who hadn't returned? The guy came from behind me with a belt. He wrapped around my neck and he drug me from one end of the parking lot to the other. You got men out there that hate anything that ain't men. And they will do physical harm to you. 